ever need needed saving, ever felt like I can't do this, I need some help, I need some rescue. I was thinking, trying to think of an example. Um, the night before I faced my ninth driving test, that was how I was feeling. Um, I really couldn't do this. My driving instructor, I'd had a few, but my last driving instructor, she'd cancelled all her other pupils. I was the last one because her mum was really ill, so she just was up all night with her mum every night and really couldn't do it, so I knew that was kind of it for me. Money-wise, time-wise, it taken me on and off about seven years by the time I got to driving test number nine, um, and I really just felt like I can't do this. The only hint of hope I had was the fact that my driving instructor used to sleep through my lessons because she was so tired from looking after her mum, and I thought, well, if she trusts me enough to sleep while I'm driving, maybe, maybe I can do it. But then on the test itself, um, you know, they ask you at some point to change lanes on a dual carriageway and I changed lanes and I looked in the rear view mirror and I saw the woman behind me just go, <gasps> I completely cut her up and I just thought that's it, I've blown it, I'm done, I'm never going to drive, I've done it. And then when we got back to the test centre, they just introduced for that test having to reverse into a parking space. I have no spatial awareness. I have no idea, I still, my dad used to say, Beth, you just know, I didn't know, I don't think it's as small, you can't actually see anything really out the car, but I was reversing in and the examiner just looked at me and said, you are allowed to pull out and have another go if you don't think it's right, and I thought, okay, I can take a hint, I'm over, I had no idea, I pulled forward, pulled back, I still had no idea if I was any better that time than the last time, and then just sat there and waited once again. Uh, I'm very sorry to say, and this guy looked at me and he said, there's two things I could have failed you for. You cut someone up, you talked me through that, and pulling into this parking space, you messed up that. But he said, but I, think you, I, I think you've got confidence to do this. I think you can drive. I'm going to pass you anyway. I can still remember his face. I was also quite pregnant. I was hoping that had been in my favour, but I'd been pregnant before and that hadn't worked. But, oh, Grace. <laughs> Undeserved favour, undeserved favour and blessing. Our new son has a lot less grace since I told him that story and loves to remind me while I'm driving, Beth, you should be driving anyway, you never even really passed. Um, <laughs> I've never harmed anyone on the road, so I have harmed my car a few times. Um, but anyway, saved by grace, that's what we're talking about this morning. I've called our talk Faith, Grace, Hope. Um, as all these talks were given on Romans, there's a great big chunk of the Bible. If you've been reading them through the week, hopefully you'll be familiar with a bit of this. So I'm not going to work through every verse at a time, but I'm going to start by looking at um, chapter 3, verses 21 through to 28. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past, or he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? No, because our acquittal is not based on obeying the law, it is based on faith. So we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. So last week, if you were here, Andrea spoke about this verse I have, verse 23, where it says, we've all fallen short of God's perfect standard, and that is the bad news, isn't it? That's where we're at. Um, although I thought, well, at least all of us are in the same boat. There's no room here for pride, is there? Um, or comparison. If you missed it and you're not sure about this, I was thinking about 
Um, I have a friend who used to say to me, well, Beth, I'm, I'm a good person, I'm okay, and God is loving, God is love, so I think I'm going to be all right with God, I think I'm okay. Um, what's the problem? Or you might just think, well, I'm better than a lot of people, if we are comparing, but it's clear here, as Andrea spoke about, no one has lived up to that perfect standard that Jesus set, an utterly selfless life of love for God and for others. And I'm sure none of us would be okay for everyone to know every thought, every motivation, everything we've done. We know we've all done things that aren't great. Can any of us honestly say that we have valued and honoured the life God has given us and lived it out to the best of our ability, laying down our life, as Jesus said, worshipped God as he deserves. Even thinking about the great commission that Jesus commanded his followers to share this good news with other people as if their very eternity depended on it. Have we always done that? Or have we sometimes got a bit tired? Or a bit apathetic, a bit lazy, a bit distracted? Bishop Handley Moore said, some may stand at the bottom of a mine, others may stand on the crest of the Alps, but they are equally unable to reach the stars. And that's where we find ourselves. That was the bad news. But at the start of these verses, Paul says, but now, now it's time for the good news. I know, um, I'm very aware of that bad news. I know I need God every day. I've shared this before. Beth, without grace, without God is not very nice, um, if I'm honest with you. And there's times in my life when maybe I drift a little bit in being aware of that and... Um, kind of cultivating that grace and presence of God in my life, um, I get a bit controlling sometimes. I can get a bit snappy. I can get a bit stressy, a bit selfish. That's me. Um, but the good news is I don't have to be that Beth anymore. God has saved me from myself and from my sin. Once and for all, the day I chose to follow him, which is actually so long ago I can't even remember it, that's the day our identity changes, isn't it? And we get this new start, sin wipes away, fresh, fresh, um, fresh new life with God. But also, that ongoing, outworking life of grace, God is saving us each day from ourselves, from lives of sin, as we learn to live with faith in his grace. Faith, um, and God will save us from that life of hopelessness and fear and the futility of life without him. This salvation that comes by grace, through faith. I'm not going to go over all these verses, but I thought I'd just highlight to show just the kind of the phrase, the theme that is repeated over and over and over again. It's through faith. It's through believing in Jesus. That's what it says. In the NIV translation, it says the word faith eight times. And the blue there is saying, well, what do we get through faith? through believing, we're made right with God, or some translations say we're made righteous, right before God, accepted to him. That's what it is, that we are now free from the penalty of the wrong things we've done. We looked at this quite a lot in our series on the cross earlier in the year, so I don't want to go over it again too much, but a just God needs justice. And we want justice. We want people who have chosen to do terrible things to have to face the consequences of that, really, don't we? We don't want God to just say, oh, it doesn't matter. It's all right, it doesn't matter. Because it does matter. Evil does matter. It destroys things. It ruins things. It hurts people. It does matter. But the good news is that God chose Jesus to pay the price for that. He paid the penalty, these verses say, so that we don't have to. And the way we receive this grace is simply by believing and as verse 27 says, this means we are now accepted by God. It's a free ticket, isn't it? That's all we need is to accept the free ticket. It doesn't matter who we are, what we've done, where we're from, what we try to offer, what we think we can bring. The ticket is free. Paul was emphasizing in these chapters that it was not just for the Jews, it was for the non-Jews as well. But for us, it means any walk of life, doesn't any background, any history, whatever. Um, come on in to a life with God. All you need to do is trust him enough to take hold of the ticket. So the first question really is, have you got this far, isn't it? Have you believed in Jesus and put your faith in him and accepted that you need a saviour, you need saving? It doesn't mean 
believing that he exists. Lots of people believe Jesus existed. The devil believes that Jesus is God. He knows that. There is a difference between believing something exists and believing in them. If I say I believe in you, that means I have a certain amount of trust in you, doesn't it? I believe in you. That's different. Verse 21 says we're made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ to be the one who can save us. It's about trusting him to do what we can't do for ourselves. And like I said, there is the first time that we do this when we accept Jesus as the only one who can save us and choose to make him Lord over our lives. But there is more to this when it comes to working it out um, each day in our lives. And we see that in the next slot we're looking at this morning is in chapter 4, where Paul moves on to start talking about Abraham, who that woman mentioned in the video, who was the father of the Jewish race. In case you don't know much about Abraham, um, he lived thousands of years before Jesus, so he couldn't actually believe that Jesus had died on the cross for his sins because Jesus hadn't done that yet. But God um, called Abraham before the Israelites even existed, before the law was laid down by Moses so he couldn't even keep the law. There was no nation following God then, it was just one man. And God said to Abraham, come away, leave your family, leave your land, leave everything you've known, I'm going to take you to a new place and I'm going to make you into a great nation, and all people on earth will be blessed through you. An amazing promise to give a 75-year-old man who had no children. In human terms, it was impossible. Um, have I got the verses up? I have. So, in chapter 4, again, I'm not going to read all of it because it's really, really long, but just some verses here as Paul is talking about Abraham when it comes to faith. So it says, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scriptures tell us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I have made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Earlier on in verse 3, it says, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He believed God's promise. For Abraham, faith meant that he believed and trusted that God would keep his word, his promises, and he made God his God, and he submitted his life, his future, his everything to God and what God had said, and he hoped, even when he couldn't see how or understand, he trusted that God did know and that God had it worked out. And that is what God is asking of us, his people, isn't it? That we trust him enough to make him Lord of our lives. Abraham did not always live this out in practice. Um, it says in verse 2, it wasn't what he did that made him acceptable. Um, he made some massive mistakes. The person who was visiting last week said a little bit about when Abraham, there was a famine where he was, so he went down to Egypt with his beautiful wife, Sarah, and he was worried. He said to Sarah, if the Pharaoh sees you, he's going to kill me so he can take you for his wife. So we're going to lie and say that you're just my sister. So what happened was the Pharaoh sees this beautiful Sarah and thinks, well, she's free, so I will take her for my wife. And he took her to live in the palace. And he gave Abraham loads of camels and cattle and goats and sheep and servants in exchange for Sarah. And it did not end very well. It caused a lot of trouble when the truth came out. He also, quite more well-known, he got a little bit tired and impatient of waiting for this impossible promise that he would be a father to many because he couldn't have children and his wife couldn't have children. So he decided to try um, sleeping with his wife's servant and she then had a baby, Ishmael. And that again caused loads of trouble, not just for that family, but actually for generations and generations to come when this grew into another tribe, the Ishmaelites. But God's grace meant that even when Abraham did have his moments of doubt, fear, impatience, whatever that was, and he didn't trust God and he did the wrong thing, God just came to Abraham and spoke to him again 
got him back on track, reminded him of the promise, and they kept on going. As people forgiven and accepted and living life as God's children, walking out that salvation day to day means that sometimes we'll have to do the same, won't we? We will have to come back to God and say, I messed up. I'm sorry, we need to confess that to God, we've got to sort these things out, attitudes, actions, whatever that might be. But we do this from a position of grace. We come to God as his highly favoured, blessed children. We don't come as a servant, kind of creeping along, thinking, well, I could get fired for this. We come from that security and position. God said it to me once, I used to shout quite a lot, you ask my older children they will tell you that I was a shouter not a sulker but I was a shouter and there was one time when my kids were quite small and it was tea time and it felt like at that season in my life some of us have been there where everything I cooked for dinner someone moaned and someone complained and I just I was I I won't even go into excuses I have no excuse I just lost it and I shouted really really loud and then I went out and just sat on the stairs in a complete state and so clearly God said to me Beth that is enough you are not going to shower your children like that again. And whew, I was convicted and I was disciplined, but I was not punished because Jesus took the punishment for me. And that's something as a parent, I always remember when my children mess up and do things wrong. I don't take the punishment. I'm not going to punish my children, but I will challenge them and convict them. And I will tell you now, that is the last time I shouted at my kids like that. If you ask my older kids, they will tell you, yeah, mum used to shout, but she doesn't anymore shout like that. Um, But that was a safe place of God's grace, so he sorted that out in me. Abraham did some pretty bad stuff. He also did some amazing stuff in faith. But the lesson from Abraham's life that Paul is talking about in this chapter 4 in Romans is that it was Abraham's faith, not his actions, that pleased God. Verse 13 says, God's promise to Abraham was not based on his obedience to God's law. The law wasn't even given yet, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. And his faith never wavered in believing God's promise. Verse 20 says, in fact, his faith grew stronger. And in this, he brought glory to God. Ultimately, our faith is going to determine our actions, isn't it? Most of the time. And for the most part, this was true for Abraham, that if we trust God, if we believe in him, we're going to follow him and do what he says, do the right thing. But primarily, this is saying that the glory that goes to God through us is not in our achievements or in our success or in how well we know the Bible or how loud we sing on Sundays or how we do the right thing or how good we are. It isn't those things themselves that glorify God, but the faith that perhaps motivates us to do some of those things, but it's the faith behind it. That it's also the faith that hangs on in all circumstances, even when we do feel like failures and we've achieved nothing, when we're broke or we're ill or we have no human answer. Or like Abraham, we feel like we have been waiting forever for the impossible and it's just not going to happen. When we still feel stuck in the grave, in the tomb, like Saturday Jesus, like we can't see any hope, and we determine to trust God anyway, that's what gives glory to him. Because we're trusting that he said it, and he's faithful, and like these verses say here, he can make something out of nothing. That's the sacrifice, isn't it? When we really want with everything we've got to step in and do it our way, but we're trusting to submit to God. That pleases him more than anything. So, What does it mean then for us living out this life of faith and grace and hope? I've got four quick points before I finish. Number one, hope and faith is not ignoring or denying the extent of the problem, how big the problem is. Oh, I haven't written anything for that. You just have to listen to me. Um, Without God, we are in big trouble. We are hopeless. We are lost. We are dead in our sins, the Bible says. It is facing the facts and acknowledging that, but then reflecting on God's character and who he is and reminding ourselves of what he has said, that actually nothing is a problem for God. That even before the first person was born, Jesus had decided to be the answer to the problem of us ruining things and messing things up. God had already come up with that answer. As it says in chapter 4, 
It's reminding ourselves that God brings the dead back to life and creates new things out of nothing. But number two, hope in God, like Abraham had, doesn't mean that things is all going to work out wonderfully, does it? We're hoping in God and his character and his faithfulness and his power um, to do that. In verse 21, Abraham was fully convinced that God would would be able to do whatever God promised. Not what Abraham thought was the right thing or the best answer or what Abraham wanted God to do, that God would say yes to all his prayers, but that what God had promised. When my dad was dying, I hoped, I had faith to know God could heal my dad. I knew that he could, but when I talked to God about it and I prayed, I really knew God was saying, I'm not going to. Dad's going to die of this brain cancer. So I chose to put my faith in God's promises, that God had promised that he would be with us every step of the way, even through the valley of death. I chose to put my faith in the God who said he really cares for the widows, that he would be with my mum and look after my mum after my dad had gone. I chose to put my faith in the fact that God promised that he would take my dad home to glory, to heaven, and that one day I will be in heaven with my dad. Not what I wanted, our hope and our faith is in what God has said. So number three, I've got four, we can't hope in what we don't know. We can't put our hope and faith in the God, in, in his character, in who he is and what he said, if we don't know what that is, can we? So part of our sort of responsibility in this is to find out what God's promises are. The more general promises in the Bible that he gives to everyone, like that he'll always be with us, he'll never leave us, or forsake us, that he works all things out for the good of those who love him. There's lots in there. We do need to read them in context, because some of the promises God says in the Bible are to a specific person in the Bible at a specific time, not necessarily to everyone, but there's a lot of them there. But also, we need to be listening out for God's promises to us as individuals, don't we? What is God saying to me in this situation about this? What is he promising that he will do, that I can hold on to and put my hope in, even if it does seem impossible I'm really spending a lot of time at the moment working on this at a real little day-to-day detailed level. Um, I loved Lynn's talk in the summer about us being in Jesus and Jesus in us so that we can do, sort of almost automatically do what the Father is doing because we're so in tune with him and listening. Um, And the more we do that, the more we pray and ask and listen and dwell in him, the more we see that he does keep his promises. He is who he says he is. And like for Abraham, the more our faith grows and the more we glorify God. A life of faith, number four, in God's grace, removes any need to be defensive, to protect our reputation, to manipulate people's perception of us to think we're better than we are, than it really is, to justify ourselves. The older and wiser I get, the less I cling on to the need to make excuses. If I'm late, I'm just going to say, I'm sorry, I'm late. I could go into these, oh, it's because of this happened, this happened. No, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm late. I should have been here one time. If I've snapped at someone, I'm sorry, I snapped. I'm not going to go into detail. Maybe it's because I was tired and stressed and then, and then, I'm sorry. That wasn't good enough. I'm sorry. A life of faith and grace just demolishes the power of shame. Paul says in some of his his other letters that he wrote, I am the least, I am less than the least, Paul says. I am the worst of sinners. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Are you the worst of sinners? Do you feel like less than the least sometimes? Welcome in to the grace of God. The ticket is for you. As it says in verse 27, it leads us to boast only in Christ Jesus. It's all because of him, isn't it? We are here because of God's grace. We didn't earn it. We don't deserve it. We were chosen. We were given the tickets and our qualifications were the nails in his hands and the broken body and his spirit willingly surrendered to death in our place. You might think, you might struggle with this. I'm not good enough. Not good enough. Well, these verses say, no, you're not. You're not good enough. What freedom in accepting that. I don't even have to try to be. Except through his mercy, which does not punish us as we deserve, and through his grace, which pours out blessing and favour on us. His spirit then lives in us to equip us and anoint us and call us to do what he's called us to do. 
Walking out this grace means that it applies to all the roles that we do, doesn't it, in life. On my own, I am not good enough. You can put me last in line in plenty of things. Driving, for sure. But God says that with him, we are good enough. He's the one that qualifies us. And you might think, well, actually, practically, Beth, I am good enough to do my job or to do what God's called me to do. Not to the level God wants you to, you're not, because he wants everywhere we go to see his kingdom come. And the only way we are going to do that is through the power and the presence and the equipping and the anointing of the king. That's the only way we live out this life that is going to change the world, God, the way God wants it to raise our kids, be a person in the light in our workplace, in our community, how God wants it to. The only way that we can do that is through him who gives us the strength and the wisdom and everything else that we need to do it. But that voice that tells us, I wonder if there's some of you here this morning that struggle with that voice that says, you're not good enough, I'm not good enough. Um, It's just irrelevant. Not good enough is irrelevant (laughs) when you step into the grace of God because it's all through him. And the answer to that accusation is, I'm not, you're right. Except through Jesus, through faith in him, I am righteous and I am acceptable. And without him, none of us are with him. We all can be. And we carry out these roles by his grace. And it's so important as we do that we then show that grace shown to us, to other people, isn't it? To our leaders or the worship team or our neighbours or our boss or whoever, our family, whoever that might be. I was asked to join the leadership team here when I was in my early 30s. I'd never thought about that. I'd, I'd always, I love preaching. Preaching was my thing. But being a leader, I knew I wasn't good enough. I knew that. Boy, I had some rough edges back then. I'm very grateful for the grace the other leaders over the years have shown me. Um, my enthusiasm that could at times veer into impatience. Or my optimism. I'm naturally quite an optimist. That could perhaps override wisdom from time to time as well. I was very aware as well, I was the first woman leader that Kings had had, and I did have some comments about that from people at church who um, didn't agree with women in leadership. So I thought, okay, I've kind of got to do all right at this because I don't want to then be the excuse that shuts the door on potentially other women in the future having, stepping into what God has called them to do. But I knew I I wasn't good enough. So I just had to, again, put my faith in Jesus. that it's him who had called me, so he would equip me, and if I just show up, say yes, and keep my eyes on him. Um, I have made some mistakes as a leader, that's for sure. I've got some regrets, but I haven't ruined everything. Church is still here. (laughs) We're still standing, we're still going. Um, Because it's his church, it's God's church, and all I had to do was keep my eyes on him, keep my faith in him, and living in his grace. A life of faith, grace and hope means that I don't need you to think I'm better than I am. I can stand here and share this stuff. I don't need you to think that I'm holier or wiser or lovelier than I am because I am accepted by the King. And it's his grace, even as he knows my weaknesses and my flaws and my failings, even the ones I try to hide from myself, because we all do that sometimes, don't we? We all try and even convince ourselves. Um, And even as God convicts us, and challenges us to do better, and he does discipline us in line with our maturity and our revelation and what we're ready for. He chooses to look at us and see Jesus, goodness and holiness and loveliness, because his grace means that we live in him and he lives in us, so he can look at us and see Jesus. And God's grace shows us, doesn't it, that all we have is from him anyway. Are we doing okay? It's God's grace. Are we quite good at that thing? It's God's grace. (laughs) Have we learned some stuff along the way? It's God's grace. None of us start life with an even playing field. We're getting more aware of this, perhaps understanding it better as we um, think on this idea of privilege, aren't we? And I can tell you as someone who's had a lot of children living in her home after the last few years from very different starts in life to me, um, where we come from, circumstances beyond our control have a monumental impact on who we are and where we find ourselves but praise God as Paul said it he can make something out of nothing as he brings the dead back to life and by his grace any one of us no matter what no matter where we're from no matter what we know we are enough 
and we have enough to do what he has created and called us to do. So this saving faith, this grace, this hope should enable us, like Abraham, to live a life of boldness and courage, stepping out and following God into the unknown, wherever he calls us, as we trust God and accept that we have no excuse to disqualify ourselves. You can't mean me, God. I'm not good enough. God might say, I don't want you to do that. So I'm not going to equip you to do that. It needs to be something else. But if Jesus is in us, and we are in him through grace, and that's what it all comes down to, isn't it, at the end? This is why people consider this portion of the Bible to be so fundamentally important, because it changes everything. This is what being a Christian is. Someone who believes in Jesus for that one time, identity changed, I belong to God now, to then working that out day by day, living a life of grace trusting him in everything, the one who was and who is and who is to come. So how could we not trust him with our eternal life and with our day-to-day life here and now? I'm going to finish by just reading some of these verses in the message translation because I love them. Romans chapter 4 is one of my favourite in the whole Bible. Um, I'm wondering if our worship team will come up. And just get ready if you want to start playing, you can, um, because I'm going to read these and then I'm going to pray. Um, So I thought it'd perhaps be good to pray for those, just in case there's any of us here who are struggling with not feeling acceptable, not feeling good enough, and also um, some of us might need hope. You know, faith, you might feel like, oh, I don't really have much faith, Um, but faith is a gift, the Bible says, so we can always ask him for more of that. But it says in Romans 4, it says, We call Abraham father, not because he got God's attention by living like a saint, but because God made something out of Abraham when he was a nobody. Abraham was first named father and then became a father because he dared to trust God to do what only God could do. Raise the dead to life. With a word, make something out of nothing. When everything was hopeless, Abraham believed anyway, deciding to live not on the basis of what he couldn't do, but on what God said he would do. He didn't tiptoe around God's promise, asking cautiously skeptical questions. He plunged into the promise and came up strong, ready for God, sure that God would make good on what he had said. Will you stand with me while... We pray. God, I thank you that we can come and stand before you now, knowing it's all been done by you, Jesus. You have done everything needed to make us righteous and acceptable and holy to stand before God, to partner with him, to be called, chosen, equipped, sent out to do the work he's called us to do. I thank you for that. I thank you for the truth that not a single person here with God is not good enough to do what God is asking them to do today. And for anyone here who's been feeling that, who's been feeling that shame or that accusation or that unconfidence, God, would you pour out your grace on them this morning? Would you just plant in them that gift of faith that it doesn't matter what they can do because they can do all things through you Christ who gives them the strength they need and would you help us those of us who are needing that grace for others in our lives as well to accept the fact that they're different to us in a different place to us would you give us that grace for others too and God for those of us this morning who need some hope again hope restored hope stirred up that you are a faithful, loving God. You bring the dead back to life. You make something out of nothing with only a word. May we choose again to set our hope on you, God, and your promises and your faithfulness and your grace. May hope arise. It says in the Bible, return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope.
time to get back to that place of hope and faith and a God who loves us, who loved us enough to die in our place. As we go into this last song, I think there are um, three different ways some people might need to respond. One way is those who need to put their faith in Jesus. Whether that's a salvation call for the first time to say, I trust in my Lord, or whether that is a, a recommittal of saying, God, I, I return, I trust in you. And I think there are some who maybe need to come and kneel at the front and say, you are my Lord. You are my Lord. I put my trust in you. I think the second response, as Beth has just been talking about there, is for those who need to hear God is saying to you, yeah, I'm with you. If we can talk leadership stories, I can remember being in this room with a, a, a friend, a prophet friend here, I was, I think I'd been six months or less in, in the role of having stepped out of schoolwork to work for the church full time. And I was doubting in my head. And this prophet friend came and said, he just looked to me and said, Mark, you're the man. God says you're the man. Get over it. Get on with it. Stop asking the question. And maybe, maybe God's not going to be as direct with you as that. But there's a sense of God saying, it's, you're the person he's called. You're the one he's equipped to do. You're the one he's saying, you can do this. And there is that sense of having our faith to step out and go, God, yeah, I trust you that I am the one who will do that. And I think the third response that is for someone here, and this is just a quote that I, I had in my Bible reading this morning from Rick Warren, and it's about this restoring hope, isn't it? Faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. Faith is waiting for God's timing without knowing when. And someone today needs to hear that God is still on your side. God is still for you. God is still with you. God is still going to give you all that you need. And God, is, God, he may not make everything perfect in the way Beth shared. But he's there. And so as we sing this final song, it might be that you just need to do a response of some sort. Do you need to, to say, God, I'm willing to lay my life down again for you? Do you need to say, God, I'm here for you? I'm the one. I'm, I'm ready to step into what you're calling me to do. Or do you need that reassurance in your heart to say, yes, he's still on my side. He's still for me. He's still with me. And in my God, I will trust.